You're watching BCTV, Brantford's Community Access Station. This is BCTV, Brantford Government Television, a service of Brantford Community Television. The following program is brought to you through the support of the town of Brantford. No Carter, no Carter D. Donald. All right, I'd like to call this uh, special meeting of the RTM to order. Everybody, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. We don't have a flag, we just can go through the motions at this point. We'll have to call the police department. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Why isn't he even on here? Jackson. Okay, special meeting of the RTM will be convened on Wednesday, January 10th, 2018, at 8 p.m. at the Brantford Hi uh, Fire Headquarters, 45 North Main Street, to consider and act upon the following matters. Just so everybody knows, when we finish this call here, we'll adjourn and then go, go into the second call. And the reason for the second call is we had a timing issue where the first call was already to the sound already, and because of the holiday season, um, it was too late to add anything. We checked with the second call, I checked with the town engineer, and uh, there were some land transactions in Eversource needed to act on this at the meeting tonight for the solar portion of it, so they could not wait till the February meeting to act on this. So when we finish this first call, we'll just move to the second so nobody leave. Okay, roll call. Okay, roll call. Representative Edelman. Here. Representative Alphone. Here. Representative Anderson. Here. Representative Black. Here. Representative Brockett. Here. Representative Buchanan. Here. Representative Comey. Here. Representative Conklin. Here. Representative Dockenvich. Here. Representative Dunbar. Here. Representative Flanagan is here. Representative Hall. Representative Hansen here. Representative Henschel. Here. Representative Ingraham. Here. Representative Jackson. Here. Representative Kelly. Representative Lawler? Here. Representative Leonard? Here. Representative Preach? Representative Riccio? Here. Representative Sandler? Here. Representative Stepanek? Here. Representative Sullivan? Here. Representative Torelli? Present. Representative Tuhill? Here. Representative Walker? Here. Representative Wells? Here. Representative Zambrano? Here. And Representative Diadama? Here. Did I say that right? Correct. Cool. <laughs> Mr. Moderator, we have a quorum, and for ex officios, we have, uh, help me out here. Uh, I'm going to James. Town Clerk Arpin, I believe Selectman Cosgrove is here somewhere, yes. Selectman Ahern is here, and that about does it. Okay. Cool. Just uh, another point of information. If any of the RTM members decide to leave the meeting before we adjourn, they have to stand up and be recognized by me and make, so we can clear the record that they, are, that they have now left the room. Item number three, to consider and if appropriate, approve changes to, I'm sorry, item two, receptions of communications, reports of committees and citizens' petitions. I have nothing. I have nothing. Nothing. Okay. No. Item three, to consider and if uh, appropriate. Mr. Moderator? Yeah. Point of order. 
Um, I would actually like to make a motion um, that we move item six ahead of item three. I'm suspecting that most of the people in the crowd are not here to hear us debate our own rules and that they might want to talk about the library. So um, I'd like to make that motion move item six, the bonding authorization, ahead of item three on the agenda. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Representative Jackson. Jackson. All right. So move item. Any discussion? Six Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> item passes. Okay, item number six, we're moving up to receive communications with respect and consider and act upon a resolution entitled Resolution Appropriating $5,245,000 for the Blackstone Memorial Library <coughs> Renovation 2018 and authorizing the issue of $5,245,000 bonds of the town to meet said appropriation and pending the issuance thereof the making and temporary borrowings of such purpose. The full text of the resolution is on file, open to the public for inspection at the t office of the town clerk. Representative Black. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Ways and Means met with uh, this item last week, and uh, the vote was three to two in favor. The vote was three to two in favor of this uh, resolution. I was in the minority, so. Uh, <coughs> leave it I think, to Representative Sandler to give the uh, majority report, but uh, the committee report would be um, to uh, move this forward, three to two. I'll and put in the, the minority report after. Okay, you're putting that in the form of a motion? I'll put that in the form of a motion. Okay, Representative Sandler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Rather than uh, go through what was presented, uh, by the Blackstone Library at the committee. We have uh, our librarian, we have the president of the Board of Trustees, we have the state uh, library director, and we have our architects and our estimators here that could give the information directly to the RTM that uh, might be useful in uh, making their decision tonight. So I'm not going to give a report. Uh, I would just ask that the, we allow the uh, people here to do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's a motion on the floor and any discussion on the motion? Well, there could be discussion. Yeah, well, I, I just want to make sure that nobody has any questions. But uh, if not, we'll move on to uh, the board here to give a presentation. Go ahead. <clears throat> yes, um, Mr. Moderator, uh, I'm Andy McCurdy, the president of the Blackstone Trustees. Um, with me is the um, Connecticut State Librarian, um, the library director, uh, Karen Jensen, our construction manager, uh, David Herr and our lead architect, uh, David Winchell. So they're all available to respond to any questions that you may have. I think you should have a, at your place a timeline of this project, which uh, just to remind you that it started uh, in 2012, and we've covered a lot of territory in the last six years getting up to, um, to this particular point. <clears throat> it's, um, uh, I think you've all received often um, descriptions of the benefits, what, what the renovation is going to do, what it will accomplish, and what receives the benefits. Um, obviously, if this project goes forward, the town will be the major funder. Um, the next major funder is the Connecticut State Library. And so we thought it might be useful for you if the Connecticut State Librarian... <coughs> Mr. McKinnon, can you move, move the mic a little? We can't hardly hear you too much. Okay. Move the mic a little closer to you, okay. that's it. <coughs> we thought it would be um, useful to you to hear why the Connecticut State Library uh, thinks uh, this project is worth their committing a million dollars to the project. So I would uh, ask uh, uh, Ken Wiggin to, uh, uh, to, to speak to you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my name is Kendall Wiggin. I am the uh, Connecticut State Librarian, and I appreciate the opportunity to come here tonight just to explain um, why the State Library Board approved this public library construction grant. And to give you a little background on these grants, um, the legislature um, for more than 30 years has seen uh, the value in, in providing uh, incentive funds to communities to expand, renovate, uh, update their libraries. Um, we get a small amount of money every year, um, usually around $5 million, and we have a lot of competition uh, for those dollars. So projects are very carefully looked at and weighed and evaluated against the needs of the entire state. Um, one of the things we look at when we're looking at these projects um, is trying to look at, okay, 21st century libraries, what are they all about? Um, 
We have three things that we really think are important when we talk about libraries today. People, place, and platform. And when we looked at, we talk about people, we're thinking of things, uh, we mean that it's the library is the hub of civic engagement uh, amongst many things. And so we saw that the creation of two new meeting spaces in the library, uh, renovation of the auditorium to accommodate larger programs, would certainly provide more opportunity and better spaces for community members to come and engage in civic dialogue. People are also essential to a library's mission to inspire learning and advance knowledge and strengthen communities. And the relocation expansion of space for children, um, well, I think goes a long way to inspiring learning. Um, I've visited the library many times over the years and I've looked at the children's room and thought, some kid someday is gonna go over that balcony. But uh, fortunately that has not happened. But think about um, the competition for kids' eyes today. Kids are you know, stimulated by a lot of their environment and you need to have a, a library, a children's <laughs> area in a library that really is inviting and it, it encourages people to bring their kids in um, and to share um, in the library. And it's not just about the books, but the programming space and all of that. So we saw this move of the children's room down to this new level uh, and expanding it is a really important way of addressing, uh, saying that the community cares about kids in this town. And we, we saw that as very important. Also, the, the addition of an area for teens. Um, I think some people don't think teens use libraries, but teens do. And one of the things a lot of our teenagers today want to do is work to collaboratively. They like to be together. Uh, and you need to create a space that allows that to happen. Uh, calling a corner of a library the teen area is not what it's all about. And we've seen many, many successful areas uh, created in libraries around our state that have really brought uh, teenagers back into the library. Now, you're never going to get them all, but you need to have some opportunity for them to get there. And it isn't just about books. They're adding computers, maker spaces, um, a lot of opportunity for kids to express their creativity um, by having a place for that to happen. When we talk about place, we're also thinking about, you know, the library is a welcoming and an accessible space for a wide range of purposes. And I think everybody in this town appreciates the beauty of the Blackstone Library. I mean, it's well known around the state uh, for its beauty. Um, but you also need to have it so that people can get easily in there. It's not the easiest library, uh, particularly if you have um, disabilities to get in there. And we saw that the, the approach was a sympathetic addition to this building. I give the architects, I compliment them on that work, but it also made it a lot more inviting um, to get into the library and for the library to provide its services. So that's an important aspect um, that we were looking at, as well as some of the new uh, spaces. And, it gets very confusing in an old library that was chopped up and in some days deemed to be, you know, you had to have a room for this and a room for that. And uh, I think many of you, even in your homes, have seen, you know, great rooms are much more used than all the individual little rooms. And when the Blackstone Library was built, that was the way you did things. And today, uh, we're trying to do it a lot differently. And I think this uh, project addresses that. And then we talk about platform. We're looking at user-centered, uh, user um, opportunities for individuals and the community to gain access to a variety of tools and resources. So the project proposes adding a lot of new computers, public workspaces, uh, workstations, as well as improving uh, the Wi-Fi in the library. And we've been really promoting uh, improvement of Wi-Fi throughout our libraries. We know many of you come in with your devices, you're expecting to connect. Um, but there are also a lot of people who don't have uh, computers uh, or may need to use um, a higher level computer than they may than their tablet. So the library provides that opportunity, whether it's to connect to important government information, community information, um, and also providing them by having a, um, a computer lab, the opportunity to do something that's becoming increasingly valuable uh, to communities and libraries are taking the lead in that, and that's digital literacy. Um, many of us are stumbling through learning to use some of this technology. You know, you got an ebook reader for Christmas and you don't know how to use it, but your kids were really great to give you that. Um, the libraries have to help people um, understand that. And even the generation that we're calling born digital is probably not going to understand the next generation of technology um, the way um, they do currently. And when you think about the users of libraries, we have six named generations in this country right now. Um, 
you know, baby boomers are a big chunk of it, but we go all the way down to Generation Z and all the way up to uh, those folks from the World War uh, II era are all still using libraries. And libraries are one of your few community services that's there for everybody, no matter what. So the program space, the library services have to be able to accommodate all of that. And we think that this project is really uh, focusing on that. Um, it's not just trying to cram some of the newest things that libraries are trying to do into a space that really was never meant to that, but instead to try to take that space and properly configure it to meet those needs and future needs. So when you take it as a whole, uh, the State Library Board was impressed with this project um, and felt that it was deserving of getting this, uh, this grant award. So I, I'd be glad to answer any questions about that, but I, I just wanted you to understand uh, why we think putting a million dollars um, into this project uh, is going to be of great value, both um, to your community and actually statewide. Um, one of the reasons the state does provide funding is also that libraries are open to anybody in the state to use, and by providing a little bit of funding uh, from the state level, it increases that access to, to your library. So with that, I'll answer any questions if you have any. Or. <coughs> Uh, Representative Rickio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Rickio, uh, what is the cost to add the back entrance? Would you know that? I think back your back architects are going to have to talk about the state, the state library. Yeah. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Can, can someone the, give me the just the entrance, just the back entrance with the terrace? Why don't, why don't we just, um, uh, Representative Ricky, I'm just going to hold off on your thing. Why don't, why don't we finish all the presentations first, and then, then we'll, we'll address. Uh, so, Karen, if you want to speak next, and then we'll move it. And then once they do all that, then we'll take questions, okay? I, I don't have anything specific to add. I think um, our state librarian really said everything that we're trying to accomplish. And I, I also wanted to let you know that we have been working very hard um, on fundraising for this project, and we have um, over 630 individual donations um, toward the project. We've raised $686,000 toward our $800,000 funding goal. Um, I'm confident that we'll meet that goal, and um, we'll do everything that we can to keep fundraising if the project is approved. And that right. means that the, um, <clears throat> the, the even at a minimum of eight hundred thousand dollars in our capital campaign goal, that means that thirty-five percent of the project is being paid for by other than other than town funds. Okay, okay. Uh, David, do you want to let, let's 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 have a presentation first, Robert, yeah, I, Peter. I just have a specific question on this. What is it? Through, through you, Mr. Moderator, in the um, committee meeting, I asked what was the cash in hand, and then some discussions with Mr. Sandler had also asked for, you know, I think some pledges are definitely good from the Brantford Community Center or Community Foundation, but if you could give me the, the cash in hand um, amount that you've raised, and then pledges from the uh, Community Foundation or other like organizations. Thank you. Okay, moving on, we will hear from the architect. <clears throat> Gentlemen, sir, you're up next. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is David Hearn. I'm with Downs Construction. Gotta move the microphone move, move it closer, can Hi, I'm with uh, I'm David Hur with Downs Construction. Uh, the approximate cost for the addition is roughly about two million dollars. Continue with your presentation. You have any else to add to it? No. Well, that, I was answering the question. Oh, you're answering the question. Okay. You can continue with your presentation. Well, I think I think that one of the the questions um, that has been raised, I understand, by a lot of people, <clears throat> and that's why why David is here, is to understand uh, how we can be reasonably sure, all of us, um, that this project is going to stay within uh, within budget. And um, David Hurry is is the the man on on that project and. So I would ask David to, to just 
summarize for you how, how that process works and how we're going to be able to ensure that this, this project does come within budget. Okay. Um, so we, we started uh, at mid-design, uh, basically at uh, design development, uh, working with the architect and uh, did a, uh, it's a full quantitative uh, survey of the, of the elements of the project. Uh, we reached out to various subcontractors that specialize in providing the, the stone work, some of the mill work, uh, mechanical electrical systems and use that as a sounding board. Then after we put together our estimate, um, we did break it up into three different sections, the exterior elements, the site development, uh, the addition, and then the interior renovations, then kind of carved that up. Then we had a um, reconciliation with the architect and, and their um, engineers and sat down and kind of filled in the blanks because the design's not 100% at that point in time. Then we uh, um, basically wrap up and say that that is the design development uh, estimate. Now the, uh, the process from that has gone into the CD documents and we're doing exactly the same kind of process all over again, uh, but the uh, details have further developed. Then um, what we did this past week was do a, it's called a ready check. It's a constructability review. So we have uh, people in our in-house uh, that uh, take a look at it, uh, both from um, our general superintendent, who's been a carpenter for 39 years, another member of our team who's a, uh, a licensed uh, architect, myself, I'm an engineer. Uh, and then we sat down and, and scrubbed the drawings and, and sit down with uh, Dave and his team and did uh, a few hours of reconciliation again. And uh, we'll be following up and doing our estimate at that point again and finishing up. Um, with that, we'll be identifying some of the items that will uh, uh, micromanage that, um, the different parts of that, um, of the project to evaluate um, cost analysis of looking at the foundations. Maybe there's a more cost eff effective way to do the, the foundations versus underpinning a a, a stone foundation, maybe we're going to put in uh, specialized piers or something like that. It looks like it has less risk. If you have less risk, it, it costs less. So it's, um, uh, we evaluate that and then develop this final estimate that we'll have b before going out to bid. We'll have a list of value engineering ideas and then also uh, add alternates that we would use to bid, um, to manage our bid day results when we go out to bid. We'll be putting it out to bid uh, to create a GMP uh, with roughly about, um, I would say about 20 or 22 bid packages. That's typically what we would do to create a guaranteed maximum price. Uh, we do provide a, uh, a guarantee not to exceed the, the contract amount. Uh, we do have uh, a built-in contingency on our part to help manage um, the elements that, um, that arise uh, during construction to see if, uh, uh, if that uh, is needed to repair it. And we'll manage our, um, our ad alternates with that. So if the farther we get uh, down, if one area, if we can upgrade carpeting or something like that or a finishes or putting in a, a, a wall, a glass wall to create a, a conference room, uh, those elements will be um, held out as an alternate and then when we haven't used a contingency line item, we can add that in at a, at a point in time and not affect <coughs> the construction schedule. Uh, we've um, also incorporated the, the enabling of doing the, um, the construction while the uh, library is open. So we've looked at, um, it's basically six different phases to, to do the addition while we're doing uh, the different flow through the uh, library of the interior renovations um, and uh, looking at all that. And the, uh, the enabling part is not something that's drawn by the architect, that's actually um, uh, engineered, if you want to call it that, um, by us. And then also uh, a schedule that we would um, put that into the bid packages with the subcontractors. That's, that's usually one of the the downfalls of, of putting something out to bid as a lump sum item is trying to 
pinpoint when you're going to be doing something in the building and not having the downtime with your subcontractors on the you know, as they're going through. You want them to stay in a nice flow that keeps it cost effective and it doesn't impact uh, the, the library's function itself. So all of that and uh, that's what we do. Uh, we do that quite often, and uh, and we maintain our budgets. Okay, thank you. Next gentleman there. Do you have anything to add to that? Or? No. Sure. Uh, we were brought on this, into this project approximately about a year and a half ago. Um, at, at that point, uh, much of the master planning was complete by by a previous firm, and at that time, we basically. Uh, we're looking at the whole project as uh, with a fresh eye and also just trying to basically reinvent the library in terms of its whole programming, as was already mentioned, um, basically kind of turning the library upside down with this program and also trying to address uh, many of the accessibility issues within the project. Um, in, a, in a general sense, the project, uh, as a, one of the questions already asked, the addition itself is probably about 60% uh, of the project and the remaining 40% is all the interior work. Now, some of that interior work uh, could not happen without that addition. So, uh, as such, um, when we look at some of the, uh, the costs related to the addition itself, we're dealing with an historic building, uh, uh, you know, really a centerpiece of the town. So, with that, there carries a, a great amount of responsibility with how do we tie this addition into the building so it does not look like a mistake, so it does not look like an addition, per se. So that's, uh, that's really what we're trying to accomplish here with a lot of the materials. The, you know, as mentioned, the footprint of the building, it's a very modest footprint, just about 2,000 square feet compared to the remaining building, which is about 25,000 square feet. Um, the fit and finishes of the building, uh, the addition will be matching the existing building. All the existing mechanicals will be tied into the building as well. So we're going to be kind of piggybacking off the existing building, again, for some more efficiencies in that instead of trying to recreate um, all new mechanical electrical plumbing systems. Mr. Else Moderator, there? I think uh, if um, we may, I'd like you to hear from one of our other major funders uh, of the project, just so you understand <clears throat> what uh, what is motivating other people to support the project. And uh, Lisa Petra from the community, the Ranford Community Foundation, is here, and I would ask. I think she's here. Come on up, Lisa. Yep, that's all right. Good evening. My name is Liza, Andy. <laughs> Liza Jansen Petra, and I'm the executive director of the Branford Community Foundation. I'm here to testify about the foundation's support of the campaign for the Blackstone. The foundation was first approached by Andy and others and Karen um, in the summer of 2016 to consider a major gift for the proposed project. We met several times to review the renovation drawings and learn the process by which they were developed, assess the budget, and get a better understanding of how they plan to meet their financial goals. We also met with town officials to understand the town's position on the project. At the same time, the Branford Community Foundation did our own investigation around the role that the Blackstone plays in Branford. A recent study we produced with Data Haven and the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven showed that annual visits to the James Blackstone Memorial Library increased from three per capita in 2004 to eight in 2014, a 267% growth in visits over 10 years. Like libraries across the country, the Blackstone has grown to be more than just a location to check out books or movies. It is a de facto community center where job seekers have access to databases to search for jobs or update their resumes, where school-aged kids can enhance their education with technology or knitting clubs, to name a few where parents can connect with other parents, where seniors can learn how to use the internet more effectively or hear a lecture, where community can access arts and culture through plays and musical events, where people in crisis can meet with a lawyer or find support, and so on. As a board, we reviewed all pertinent information and spent several internal sessions discussing the merits of the case and how and whether to support such an ambitious project. 
based on the unique and critical role that the Blackstone has grown to play in our community and recognizing that the existing configuration does not meet the current, let alone the future needs of our community, the foundation decided not only to commit to the effort, but to provide the single largest grant in our 37 year history. Our commitment, however, came with strings attached. Our intent for our $100,000 grant was to encourage and demonstrate broad community support for the expansion and renovation. Our grant is a challenge grant. We have committed to matching each donation, dollar for dollar, up to 1,000 that comes into the campaign. The last I heard, Monday, 596 individuals have provided a qualifying gift, resulting in a total of $90,930 towards our $100,000 match. We have been enormously impressed with the community's support after only six months of fundraising. The support provided yet more evidence that the Blackstone's proposed project is one that the community not only needs, but is willing to support financially as well. The mission of the Brantford Community Foundation is to connect people who care with the causes that matter. And we believe that our matching grant to the Blackstone Campaign Project has been a wonderful example of that. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Brantford Community Foundation. Thank you. Okay, at, at this point, I would like to off, uh, open up for discussion from the RTM, uh, <coughs> Representative Walker. Does this work? Does this work? Don't know. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And through you, Mr. Moderator, thank you, Liza, Karen, gentlemen, for that presentation. Uh, I don't think there's anyone here who would argue or who wouldn't agree that the Blackstone Library is a total jewel in the town of Brantford and a wonderful jewel for the citizens of the town of Brantford. However, my feeling is that the bulk of the taxpayers of the town of Brantford do not even realize that it is not a town of Brantford institution. And uh, the fact that we are being asked once again as the representative town committee to come up with the funding, the bonding, the debt source, for renovation when we cover what, approximately 85% of the operating budget every year for a non Brantford town owned institution is I think somewhat inappropriate. I think the procedure that has been undertaken in terms of grants and private fundraising is absolutely wonderful. But uh, there are many people in this town who are going to be hard hit by a new tax reform act, which took away state and local tax deductions largely. And uh, we've really been clobbered left and right. And I think uh, to take this on and, and bear this is uh, something that I could not support. So thank you. Uh, let's see, Representative Black, and then we'll go to uh, Representative Henschel after that. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Through you, I'll try to give a uh, minority report. Um, I voted in opposition to this uh, proposal. Um, it's not because I haven't, I don't support or haven't supported the Blackstone. And the, Past, I, I certainly have. I mean, one of my favorite beneficences on a personal level was always the Blackstone. I thought they made good use of the funds that I gave them, that it was an efficient organization. Um, but I can't support this expansion. First of all, let's not uh, hide our head in the sand. By taking on this additional debt, this is a vote for a tax increase to the taxpayers of Connecticut. We're adding debt and burden to the taxpayers of Brantford for a purely discretionary project. This isn't a project that we have to do. It's a project that some folks 
want to do. We're doing it at a time where we are being crushed as a state, as Representative Walker mentioned, we have the federal tax changes that will hit upper income taxpayers by reducing their ability to deduct their uh, state and local income taxes, including property taxes. The uh, state is being crushed right now. They're in deficit. They are doing a Medicare revision that's going to push us further in deficit in the current budget. So they're going to be looking to cut municipal aid, including to towns like Brantford. I don't think that's, that's in doubt at all. Um, the governor and some others have supported pushing on us <coughs> teachers' retirement benefit, pension funding, that was something that we never took on. And we don't know if that's going to happen. But it's not looking good at a state level. We know the state is losing population. We know a Yukon study for populations in, within the state said that with, by 2040, the town of Brantford is likely to decrease its population by 4,000 people. We've been static for a while. So we're not a growing community. We're not a growing state. Um, we're in trouble as a state. That trouble is going to come down to us. It's going to roll down to us as a community, as a town, and onto the property taxpayers. So if we vote for this, we're voting for a tax increase on the property taxpayers. Now, second of all, some of these items that the expansion is intended to address are already ad addressed otherwise. Meeting rooms. We're building a community center that's going to increase our meeting rooms. Computer access, that again is addressed in the community center, senior center project. So when it comes to computer access, we're already addressing that in other places. Um, this project, as we say, you know, roughly 60% of it, the cost may be in a grand entrance, which is primarily aesthetic, as it's been explained to me. It's been explained, you know, you want people that come in the back door to feel like they're coming in the front door. That's not a necessary expense when we're looking at some pretty substantial tax increases. We had a budget increase this year of 7% overall when inflation is running roughly 2% or less, the tax increase on everybody's property taxes this year is about 5%. That may continue. And in other words, well over the rate of inflation. So for those reasons, I voted in, <coughs> in opposition to this in committee and uh, expect to vote in opposition to this motion on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Representative Henschel, and then we'll go to Representative Sopanik. Through you, Mr. Moderator, um, with, with respect first to Representative Walker's comments about the fact that the library is not a town-owned facility and, and his observation that the most people in town consider it to be part of Bradford and a Bradford facility, I would suggest that this, in fact, is a benefit. This is not a burden. Uh, on the town. We're, we're in fact benefiting from the fact that a good portion of the funds to operate the facility, and in this case a good portion of the funds to improve it, are not coming from the town, don't have to come to the, from the town, and they normally would. If, if Blackstone were in fact owned by the town, uh, we'd be on the hook for, for the whole tab here, and we'd be looking at paying all the operating costs so it's, I, don't, I don't view that as, as a deficit. I think we have a, a tremendous opportunity here. Um, in respect to Mr. Black's, Representative Black's comment that this is a discretionary project as opposed to everything, every other project in town, 
I would propose that it is, it is no more or less discretionary than Walsh or the Senior Center or the Community Center um, or any of the other projects that we have on, on our agenda for the town. Uh, the facility is an icon. I think that many people have spoken and will speak very eloquently about the value of the library. This particular library is a center and a, and a hub of the community and what it means to the community. And I'll leave it to them to, uh, to do that, but I think that it is, it is an icon, it is a hub, and it is a tremendous opportunity. I would like to ask, I, I've received in the course, and I'm sure a lot of the other representatives have, many uh, emails and letters of support a few against and, and a few with some concerns. I, I received 12, 12 uh, emails in support of the project, three again, definitely against it, and two in concerned. And the concerns which I'd like to focus on are concerns about the cost and primarily control of the cost and the, the possibility or and hopefully lack of eventuality of having cost overruns on this project. So. I think the, the first question I would have, and you can, I'll take these one at a time, you can answer as uh, whichever of you feels most appropriate to, to do it, but um, you had, the, the construction manager had, had mentioned that you were in the course of doing a series of, of estimates of the project in terms of its cost. What, what in fact is the total project cost of, as of your latest estimate, including any contingencies? Uh. We're at uh, five million two hundred and thirty-seven seven ninety-eight. Okay, um, and I take it that the project's been done as a construction management project with a guaranteed maximum price. Is that correct? That's correct. And how much is uh, being put in for construction cost contingencies? Uh, we are uh, will be carrying a uh, construction. Uh, contingency within the the contract at um, roughly 198,000. It's at five percent, and then the owner is also uh, carrying a five percent project contingency. So it's a total of a 10 percent contingency between the owner and the, and the construction. And right now, I'm carrying a 10 percent design and estimating contingency because we're in mid design. Okay. So with, with that said, if the project, actually the bids come in and at that or below that, that amount and we get the, hundred, uh, the million dollar state grant and at least 800,000 in, in uh, capital funds from fundraising, the, the town would ultimately be on the hook for $3,445,000. So the final question is if in the eventuality that unforeseen circumstances push the cost over that point. What does the, the group, what does your, your group intend to do to <coughs> raise additional funds? Because I do understand that this contract is going to be held uh, by, the, by the town, not by the library. <coughs> so technically the town would be on the hook to start with. We would, in, we would intend to um, continue fundraising. Um, we're going to continue fundraising to see if we can raise more than $800,000 anyway. We, we, if we can do better, and we'd like to try and, and do better, we think we can. Uh, we, we would, we would um, accept responsibility for trying to raise the, uh, the additional funds necessary to cover any cost overruns. However, we're very, very confident with our construction manager that, we're, that that isn't going to be uh, necessary. So in the, in the best case scenario, and your project is under the project total estimate, and you raise more than the 800000 in fundraising capital funds, I would presume that means the town would be on the hook for even less than the $3.4 million? <clears throat> yeah, all of the funds that we're raising are all committed to the project. They all go into the project. Good. So if we go beyond uh, the 800000 then that would accrue to the benefit of the town. That's, that's the conclusion of my questions. I would just say that I'm, I'm totally for this project. I'll be voting for it. I hope that we will be able to, to pass this and, and get it moving forward. And I do view it as a tremendous opportunity, which I hope we will not uh, give up by voting against this tonight. Okay, Representative uh, Stepanek, got it.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I'm uh, sadly <coughs> going to vote down, not in favor of this project. Uh, I certainly favor the library. Uh, since we arrived in Brantford, my wife and I use it. Uh, all of my books from Christmas presents that I don't read, I return and donate to the library. And what, what bothers me especially is that this whole project has become controversial because I think everyone in this town supports the library. There's no, no doubt about that. Everyone I know spoke to supports it. However, they don't support this project. This project was really, really ill-conceived. Uh, the first floor, when I go in there and read, and there's other seniors in there reading, it's a comfortable room. You come off the back parking lot. The back door does not need to be a palace. Uh, the kids don't need to be removed from the third floor. Yes, I too, when I had kids up there using the teen room, the little room, um, yes, I did worry about them falling off the balcony. Uh, I, based on my construction knowledge, I, I think for twelve thousand dollars you could put up a barrier a little considerably higher. You don't need to spend five point two million dollars. So from head to tail, this project was poorly conceived. In fact, I would go to be really honest. It's an embarrassment to our town that we have an icon of this beauty that uh, what came up with this project. So what what I would like to see happen is that this is turned down and the library board comes up with a better plan, a realistic plan that takes into account the fiscal realities of Connecticut, of this town, and uh, comes up with a proposal that we will, that will come to the RTM and that, as it usually happens, it will pass with flying colors because it's reasonable. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Let's see, uh, Representative Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I, I don't even know where to start. After Representative Black spoke, I thought we ought to pass around the Kool-Aid and all just commit suicide. I mean, that was, that was like a death notice. We're talking about a library. The library is the treasure of this town. Uh, I think that there are lots of things about the library, well, maybe not lots, but a few things about the library that we may have issues with. Um, it was designed by people who knew better, hopefully, uh, than we all do, but we all see things, well, should the kids really move from upstairs to downstairs? Do they really have to change those handicapped bathrooms? But those are really small issues. Um, uh, I don't. I don't deal with uh, the quantitative things too well. Uh, but um, to answer the question about whether this is not a part of the town's uh, group of buildings, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little mystified by that because if the library wasn't the library, then the town would have to build one. So we should be happy that we have this treasure here and not really worry about whether we absolutely own it or not, because we do own it. Um, which brings me to the next point, which is that um, I'm an architect, and um, over the years I've become a little mystified uh, by the trend in this country and in other countries where libraries which are falling into disuse because people don't need the books like they once did are burgeoning. I mean every city, every town in America is developing phenomenal libraries. I mean they're, they are the place where people go. They are community centers. They're not the senior center is not where we're going to get our computer training. Um, <coughs> this is not where the senior center is not where we're going to have maker labs. Um, it uh, this is a vibrant place, and it should be a vibrant place. Um, and I'm hoping that it will be a vibrant place uh, because we're putting money into it. Um, it just seems to me that. Uh, it, it's almost a no-brainer. Uh, I don't want to go on forever, but uh, a few months ago, this body 
had to act on a six million dollar bond issue. And the six million dollars wasn't for a building, it was for an energy audit or energy saving thing. And this body was told that in spending this six million dollars that we were going to bond, um, we would be saving all that money. So it actually wouldn't even cost us anything. Uh, I didn't believe that. Um, I thought we could do all that without the bond issue by just changing a bunch of light bulbs and changing some furnaces. Um, but the body didn't go along with that. But the point I'm trying to make is that uh, the point I'm trying to make is that the the money that we were going to spend for that is is not of great value relative to the money that we spend on this. This is uh, a resource for our community, and um, I hope we pass it. Representative Endelman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just have a few quick things to state. I would like to quote the state librarian again, who said that the library is uh, the hub of civic en engagement. And I don't think that the um, necessity for the library renovations is any less than what your, this body had voted for for Walsh School. And I think that you can't separate the uh, library from the educational resources that the town provides. And um, although we have a civic response, I mean, fiduciary responsibility as members of this committee to the town, first and foremost, um, the, the price and the way it was structured really isn't that um, so alarming for the rate of return of what we would get for the new library. So I would strongly support the new library, and thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Tuhill. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I was on the RTM 20 years ago when the Blackstone issue came up then, and I voted for it. So I decided to take a little trip to the, uh, the vault at the town hall, do some research. And this is what happened. Back then, the cost of the project was, uh, it was $2,920,000. At that time, the Blackstone, which as you know, has three floors. Only the first floor could be used by the public. Upstairs, there was a bird collection owned by Torvald Hammer and the family. And you could only go up there under escort to see the stuffed birds. <laughs> that was the only room available upstairs to the public. The whole downstairs was closed. There was a lot of speculation by us kids as to what was in there and what was down there. But we really didn't know because we weren't allowed to go down there. Also in those days, there was not a rear entrance. So 20 years ago, the Board of Trustees of the Blackstone, first, they chose the uh, construction company, which was, uh, which was in town, and uh, uh, they started work. And they created, for the first time, that very rear entrance we're talking about today. That was 20 years ago. At that time, on the board, we had, um, we had a great president, Joan Burdick, she was a terrific uh, person on that board and she pushed this through. So um, my point is, as you can see, if those improvements were not carried out 20 years ago, I mean, still, you'd only have the use of the one floor, there wouldn't be any entrance in the rear. So I believe that we should proceed today. This board has worked very hard to get this project through. We have the grant from the state that has as we just heard from Representative Black, that's going to be gone for sure if, if we don't take advantage of it. These are our tax dollars coming back to Brantford residents, and we should take advantage of it. Uh, the cost to Brantford to do this project, it's not costing us 100%. It's only costing us 64%. The rest is a, the grant and also the, you know, the, the money that's been raised by the board. So. Um, I think we should proceed. I think it's a real golden opportunity. Now it's true, there are computers going over to the new senior center and that's gonna be great. But keep in mind that there's a lot of Brantford people, right? There's all kinds of incomes in Brantford. We have high and we have low. You know, 
there's only 15 stand-up areas for people to use the computers, and they can only use them for a period of 15 minutes. Now, you know, the way it is today, it's so important to get email and use email, and you've got to be comfortable. They did a great job with their computer um, facilities in the town of Guilford, and that's the plan here in Brantford. There's going to be 25, you know, tables that you can have the computers on, people can go in, take their coats off, and you know, actually, uh, you know, so um, it's for those people too. So, uh, you know, please, all of us should vote for this tonight. Thank you. Representative Riccio. Did you want to talk? No? no? Any other members of the RTM? Representative Sullivan? Yeah. I have that mic. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I do have some prepared notes, but uh, I just have to make a quick comment uh, so that the irony isn't lost on the fact that there are concerns about the federal tax reform by Republicans on this body that was pushed upon us by Republicans at the federal level. Um, so I just had to make a note of that. Um, very quickly, and do not be secretive, I rise in support of the Blackstone Library Expansion Funding. I visit the library often, and my eldest daughter just recently got her own card for signing out books. She's very excited about this new uh, responsibility. And um, I believe that this vote is a chance for us as a community to share where we place our, uh, where we place our priorities. So it was a chance to show we believe in providing services to those that need them, a chance to show we believe in investment in our town resources and infrastructure. The Blackstone is a proven resource used by hundreds of our residents every single day. We should be voting to support those residents. When we in government are not proactive and invest in our resources and infrastructure, they degrade and crumble. In fact, this is one of the largest complaints heard around Connecticut that our outdated and crumbling infrastructure is a problem. We can't allow that to happen here in Brantford. Communities across Connecticut recognize that libraries of today and the future are more than just a place for books. You know, this investment moderate, modernizes our Blackstone Library and ensures that we can provide relevant services to our citizens. Without internet access or technology in their homes, many people rely on the resources provided at the library to maintain critical personal functions and communication. Unless Brantford is investing in providing townwide broadband, which some municipalities in Connecticut are actually doing that, we need to be sure to in invest in the internet and technology at the library so that they are accessible and as modern as we should expect here in our town of Brantford. This vote is about being for providing services to our citizens or not providing services to our citizens. Our library deserves these upgrades and we deserve these upgrades. Now, recently it was apparent that there is financial support for this project with a unanimous board of finance vote and I also believe vocal support of our finance director, Jim Finch. But one critical voice that we haven't heard from is our first selectman. I asked through the moderator to hear his opinion on this project. Uh, yeah, just, just let, let Jamie get up first and then we go next, okay? Selectman Cosgrove. You sit right here. Jamie, you sit right here. <laughs> My opinion of this project has been consistent throughout. There's many elements of this project that are warranted, that make sense. Namely, moving the children from downstairs to the main level, making the, further, uh, making the building further uh, accessible uh, where needed. <clears throat> Those are all elements that need to be addressed. You know, I don't think we need to make this a political issue from comments that have been made. This body here is the elected body. You all have an obligation to represent your constituency. This is where the vote takes place. This is your responsibility. So I say to each and every one of you, vote your conscience. Vote your conscience. Is this something, you're hearing an argument, you're making a presentation from the board, you're, here, you're debating it on the floor. 
This is your responsibility. This isn't a political issue. I think I've heard that statement, we shouldn't be making it. But the comments and the, the positioning start to go that way. Again, I say it to each and one of them, vote your conscience, that's your responsibility as an elected official. Mr. Meyer, I'd like to follow up. Um, Selectman Cosgrove, as you are also an elected official, where, how would you vote on this project? Uh, I think your point of been in a position like that. Representative Riccio, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I also have a prepared statement. But I would like to make uh, clarify one statement that Representative Jackson said. It was not a $1.6 million bond. I believe it was a $1.5 million bond. Just for, for the record. Okay. This is a, uh, a difficult topic or, or project to uh, vote on tonight. And I'm going to take a different approach to this, talking a little bit about what First Selectman <coughs> Cosgrove just talked about. The Blackstone Library renovation, in my opinion, has nothing to do with let's stop spending money. We all know that the town of Branford is in good shape financially. I don't think anyone will disagree with that. I could come up here and debate and discuss we are spending too much money as a town. And I've heard many people say that. Or why should the town be paying for renovations for a building we don't own? However, as an RTM body and as a representative representing your neighbors, we are charged to evaluate, and this is our charge, our responsibility is to evaluate projects based on is the project a need or is the project a want or a nice to have. The Black, in my opinion, the Blackstone Library renovation project falls under a want or a nice to have. And as a body, as a representative of this body, every single one of you have a responsibility to represent the Brantford citizens in their taxpayer, in our taxpayers, and how we're spending money. And it's important. And this is what I want you all to remember. It's important that we do things in order of importance. Especially, especially because of the uncertainty of the state budget. Many of us feel, on both sides of the aisle, and I've spoken to many of you, feel that some aspects of this project make sense, as First Selectman has suggested. Yet many of us, on both sides of the aisle, and there's going to be people who are going to vote yes on this project, who feel there's elements of this project that don't make sense, including the back $2 million back entrance, which is the driving force of this price tag. Now, I want to ask you, the library is very proud to remind us that over 500 people visit the library every day. Right? We all heard that. 500 people, okay, I don't know. I, I'm not in the parking lot counting, counting cars. Well, I guess the back entrance seems to be working. If 500 people are visiting the library every day, it ain't preventing people from not coming. So. That $2 million entrance doesn't add books, doesn't add space for computers, doesn't add space for conference rooms. It's an entrance in a terrace. So I have, I'm, I have questioned the board of, board of directors. 
Have you considered a lower price tag? It proposed the absolute needs, that's the key word, needs of the library. And did you give or propose different options? I didn't see any different options. I saw one option, a five point new $2 million option. Unlike other buildings that we provide money for, we get different options. If you ask the regular taxpayer, the regular citizen, the consensus, there are more important needs or projects that are required for the town of Brantford, including operating Sliney School, finding a public works facility, rather than upgrading the Blackstone Library to provide a larger, bigger back hallway or entrance, in my opinion. And just check the blog sites and the comments are overwhelming in favor not to support this project. I received many emails from people who support and don't support this project. But I'm gonna read one. And this email sums it up. And, and I, none of these emails were solicited. These are all emails that came from the general public. <laughs> Dear RTM members, oh, we don't wanna read that one. <laughs> you already started. <laughs> this was addressed personally to me, Mr. Riccio. I met you several months ago at Marco's Pizza. At that time, I shook your hand and thanked you for all your hard work as a member of the RTM. I told you that I admired the fact that you asked questions regarding budgets and the spending of money by the town of Branford. I also told you that I was a registered Democrat. However, I always voted for you. I'm sure that you don't remember the conversation because I'm sure you've met so many Branford citizens. However, I am asking you to please vote no tonight for the addition to the library. Blackstone Library is a gorgeous building that does not need a hideous addition. Most importantly, we the taxpayers should not allow this to continue at our expense to please a few. I sincerely hope you will take these comments into consideration when voting this evening Please vote your conscience. And again, thank you for all your hard work. Sincerely, Carol Alfano. That email personally sums it up. Sums it up. And so my message to every single RTM member on this body is should taxpayers be paying for a project that is a want? and not an absolute need? And should the wants of a small group of individuals override the needs of 30,000 citizens? I will be voting no on this project, and I encourage you to vote no also. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Uh, Representative Buckingham, and then we we'll go to Representative Hansen. Right, uh, through you, Mr. Moderator. Um, so when I was learning about the library and the needs of the library, um, it came to my attention that this is actually a need in our town. Um, 32,263 people used the computers in the library in 2016, which averages out to about 88 people a day. Um, and the public meeting rooms were used 2,431 times. Um, and often there are no vacancies for these meeting rooms and there's a great need um, for students that need to work on group projects, sim similar things like that. Um, besides the fact that we need the resource, um, there are also a lot of 
things that need to happen in order to make this library accessible for people with disabilities. And I believe that's a very important thing and I really value that and I value inclusiveness and I think that we need to be inclusive here in Brantford. Um, and just a personal anecdote, when I first moved here and tried to find the entrance to the library, I had a terrible time. I almost went in the employee entrance and I almost walked around the front of the building to go up the front steps because it wasn't clear. Um, I like the new addition. I think it's going to open it up, make it more accessible for people um, so they don't have to maneuver their way through that door, especially people with disabilities. So I will be voting in favor of this project tonight because I believe that we need it and I believe that the people of Brantford deserve it. Yeah. Um, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Karen. Thank you to all you guys who presented. You did a great job. Thank you to everybody in the audience. I'd like to make a comment. Why? Oh, are you making a yeah. comment? Yeah. Oh. Uh, he, he, no, he gave I me the floor. No, he gave me the floor. I, I, I recognize okay. uh, Thank you to everybody in the audience for... Uh, for no, he doesn't have to stand. No, he doesn't make me. This, 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 uh, this section doesn't have to. <laughs> well, I'll stand for you, Peter. You want me to, you want me to stand? Just, you know. Th thank you to everybody in the audience, uh, whether for the project or against the project. You're doing your civic duty. You're, you're expressing your, uh, your thoughts, your uh, desires. But, uh, man, nobody wants me to talk. Um, so I, I love a lot of things in this world. Um, I love my job. I love this town. I'll go as far as saying I love all 30 of you, all 30 of us. Um, I, I love my naps after a long night at the firehouse if I could sneak them in. But um, there's nothing more than I lo that I love more than my family. And I'll say the Blackstone Library, uh, my five-year-old Adam Jr. and Luke, who's now a year and a half, I can say unequivoc unequivocally that uh, the Blackstone has helped shape the minds and who my boys are today. Uh, Adam's now five. He doesn't get to go as much because he's in school. Uh, Luke's a year and a half. So all the things that I got to do with Adam, going to stay and play, going to story time, going to all the things that we value at the library, I get to do it again with my youngest. I love it. Uh, I brought props. <laughs> The latest books Adam took out are A Day with Police Officers, <laughs> What's Inside a Police Station, What's Inside a Police Car, <laughs> and Community Helpers, Police Officers. <laughs> now, uh, Captain Dunbar and I believe Chief Halloran's in the room. Um, don't get too excited because he might be five, but he's smart enough to take the fire test, not the police test when he's 18. <laughs> so, he's, so, uh, but uh, seriously, the Blackstone has helped shape my boys, and uh, I've heard the comment before of these things are a thing of the past, books that you flip through, paper books. When I sit there with my boys and I read to them in the recliner at night before bed, I've tried reading to them on this, and it's not the same thing. There's something special about holding a book, flipping through it. My youngest, he's flipping the pages now. <coughs> Whatever, I'm not going to go on and on, but there, there's... These things aren't dying. They're, they're a part of our community. And um, I said this at Ways and Means the other day, and we are charged on this body to make some huge decisions and uh, to appropriate the funds for an $88.2 million remodel of the middle school. A 12 million, I know it's not exactly 12, of a community slash senior center. And I'm not an expert in any of these fields. Um, I rely on a lot of the, the studies, the presentations, uh, the meetings. I haven't been able to go to many. Uh, I have a, a sick family member, but I've been watching them on TV, on BCTV. And we rely a lot on the people who have stake, uh, stake and stock in these projects. And I had said this, and I'll repeat myself, at Ways and Means, uh, three uh, women that I highly respect in this town, Ms. Susan Barnes, Eunice LaSala, and an old teacher of mine, Mrs. Baldwin, were there. All people that I highly regard, that have a huge stake in this, and that really want to see this go forward. And they've been in this town for a lot longer than myself. And if I could see that much love for this project, there's got to be something good about it. And again, I just I will support this uh, wholeheartedly. And I thank you those for those who showed up tonight in support of this. And thank you.
Mm. <laughs> Any other uh, representative Rocket? Uh, I have a uh, short prepared statement and I am new to the RTM. This is my first term, but I am not new to this town. I was born and raised in this town and I've been going to the James Blackstone Library for probably 65 years. Um, thank you again, Mr. Moderator, and thank you to all the folks attending tonight. I am voting in favor of the library renovation project and I would like to tell you why I made this decision. In my view, the responsibility of an RTM member is to make sure that a project of this size and scope must be A, thoughtfully planned, B, fiscally responsible, and C, benefit the town residents. I firmly believe the library renovation project meets all three of these criteria. First, the director of the library and the board of directors have dedicated four to five years to the planning stage of this project. I have met with board members and the library director and I have conducted my own research. I have been impressed that an enormous amount of careful and intelligent thought went into this project and their recommendations are very sound. A review of the fiscal data shows that both the state of Connecticut, as you heard tonight, and the citizens of Brantford share the view that investing in the library is a sound decision. The total project cost is approximately 5.2 million. As you've heard tonight, there's a million dollar grant from the library state. There's another $800,000 from the library itself and perhaps more if their fundraising exceeds that, bringing the cost to the taxpayers of $3.4 million. The contribution from the town is reasonable and represents about 65% of the cost. So the question is what will that investment mean to the town of Brantford? More than 10,000 residents in this town have library cards. That's one third of all the people that live in this town. And thanks to the work of the board and the architectural firm, our citizens will be able to take advantage of a renovated library that will provide better space for young children, a new teen center, a vast expansion of technology, additional meeting space, increased programs, and a more efficient library. In short, it's taken the library from the 19th century to the 21st century. Looking at it another way, the 21st century library is more than just books, as you've heard tonight. I would prefer to call it a community education center as did Liza from the Brantford Community Foundation. It is an active learning center and serves as a secondary resource in support of education. Renovations similar to this have taken place throughout the state of Connecticut. As a result of those renovations, libraries have seen substantial increases in annual visits, daily visits, as well as multifold increases in programs and attendance to these programs. I would remind all of my colleagues, Republican and Democrat, that the James Blackstone Memorial Library is one of the finest libraries in Connecticut. Every resident of this town owes a deep debt of gratitude to Timothy Blackstone for providing the vision as well as the funds to build and operate such a magnificent building. We have an obligation as RTM members and citizens of this town to continue that vision for today's residents today's children, as well as the future residents of this town and the future children in this town. I would like to personally acknowledge and thank Representative Robin Miller, Library Director Karen Jensen, and the entire Board of Directors for their tenacity, hard work, and commitment to such a worthwhile and much needed project. The library's mission is to educate and enrich the community. That mission means something different in the 21st century than it did in the 19th century. This renovation will help our residents achieve their personal goals by educating them in new technology, providing opportunities for learning that will provide personal and professional opportunities. I fully understand that the expenditure of 3.5 million is significant 
and I take my decision to support this funding very seriously. But I see this as an investment in our future and a fulfillment of our promise to educate and enrich the community of Brantford. A very famous news anchorman summed it up succinctly many years ago. Whatever the cost of our libraries, the price is cheap compared to an ignorant nation. Walter Cronkite. I am proud to vote yes and sincerely hope that all of my colleagues, Republican and Democrats, will vote to support this wonderful library. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. All right. Any of uh, Representative Zambrano? Okay. If I misspoke, I meant to say Robin Sandler. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Zambrano, and my district is District 1. I have received as well many letters um, in pro and con. When I was going on my campaigning, and this is my third term, I spoke to a lot of people, and of course the greatest concern is their taxes. Every time we spend, we get a bond, and that means we have to pay it off, and that means tax money goes toward that. And People are trying to retire. What do we, what do we have now? 25, 26% maybe of our population that's of retirement age or retired already. I find the library lovely. I mean, I think everybody can agree to that. I think my biggest concern is why some of these maintenance items like handicapped laboratories were not taken care of over the years. Why the tiles weren't replaced so that it would be very perky. Why did they ever move the kids upstairs rather than down? But I take my granddaughter there, probably once a week if she comes up to my house to spend the night. When I go in there, I see one child, maybe two. I go downstairs, I see maybe three people. Okay, it might be two o'clock in the afternoon or three o'clock. Maybe the masses come in later. I've been told according to the grant form that there are 567 people that come to the library a day. Then I was told there's 800 people that come in. Then I was told that when you go through the door, it clicks for two people, even if it's one person. <coughs> I don't know what the answers are. I think at this time, we've got a lot going on, and from what my constituents say, we have a lot going on in this town right now. And let's not take on another burden. The idea, the, the modifications are lovely. They, they truly are, uh, but right now, I know we've got that million dollars if we pay two, but it's another tax burden for the people of Brantford. And oh, well, we paid 88 for, 88 for this. No, we paid 50. Okay, it goes on and on and on, and we never say stop spending. Let's have the moratorium. Let's just stop. Let's give it a break. All right, you've got the, if you're going to continue to have fundraisers, there's a lot of avenues for those fundraising, I think. I mean, I know the state, okay, fine, you can't guarantee that maybe next year. Beautiful building, no doubt, but the people of Brantford have had it with their taxes. And we've got a decent mill rate, and we work very hard as a team to keep the taxes down. But right now, who benefits? The rotunda will be offices and some meeting rooms. We have 14 meeting rooms in the town of Brantford. If anybody needs a meeting room, this can even be divided into two. Let's step back and say, no more right now. Just stop it. Let, let's, it's a beautiful library. We can still use it. Fix the handicap, or fix the lavatory so the handicap can come in. The back door is fine. You want to enlarge a little bit, enlarge a little bit. But you can't be spending more money. We just can't do it. I'm sorry, I have a lot of friends out there. They'll probably hate me for this. But I tell you what, I've got the other friends who are not in favor of this. And constituents door to door with their taxation. So I cannot vote for this. Um, I wish I could. Uh, but I, I just think there's too many people that are worried about where does the state go. Right. Any other uh, RTM uh, person that hasn't spoken? <coughs> if not, I'd like to open it up to the audience. If anybody would like to get up and dress the, uh, the body. Oh. Well, so, uh, there just a couple uh, away. Children here would like to talk to All right, why don't we let the children get up and speak first? Uh, I would like to address two things that have not been mentioned. Mr. Black and the others who spoke 
saying, oh, we can have computers at the new senior center. Ma'am, 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 excuse me, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. He's up here. I'm up, up here. here. Yeah. Ide identify yourself and what in your oh, residence. My name is Genevieve Goff. I'm 90 years old. I've been a Branford resident. And I came to both of the meetings which were open for the new senior center. All the people who were there, we were all against it. And yet you said that we were for it and you voted for it. And you did not mind all that money being spent. And yet you sit there today and you don't want to spend a little bit of money on the a library. Let me tell you, this new damn senior center that you're going to build, there will not be rooms for the computers. There will not be room, separate rooms for meetings. There's going to be one big, huge room with dividers which are, uh, you can hear sounds through them. They're not soundproof. They're not going to be, in fact, Two months ago, a friend of mine called the, scene, the center now and asked to have a meeting room, and she was told there wasn't room. What the heck do you think is going to happen when they add four more spaces for senior center? There's not going to be room, and there's not going to be room for the computers. And the other thing I would like to address is, I mean, so you're willing to spend money and even an increase in money for the new senior center. You didn't put it on the ballot at November to find out that most of the citizens were against it. You blindly say, oh, we all wanted it. And you canceled the third meeting because we told you in both of the two meetings you had that we were against it. And now you're doing the same thing here. How many of you are for it? Raise your hand. Do you see those hands go up? So you people who say you're gonna vote for what the people in Branford want, that's what they want. And if you vote against it, you are not voting for what the people in Branford want. The last thing I'd like to mention is, as you can see, I have trouble walking. I'm looking forward to this new entrance, which you say is not necessary. <coughs> Try walking in the rain, balancing a cane, an umbrella, and a bag of books. And believe me, I'm looking forward to this new entrance where I won't have to walk as far. There are three, I'm in a lot of book groups. I go to the library almost twice a week to either pick up books or movies. I can't go to the theaters anymore. I'm there to pick up books or movies and return them. And I'm telling you, it's a, a, a three of the book groups I'm in meet at the library, at the library. So we older people, we love the library, we use the library, and it will be easier to access. And damn it, that's what most of the people in Branford want. So those of you who are going to vote against it, don't tell me you're voting what the people want. That's not what we want. All right, can we have uh, the students uh, next? If you just tell me, uh, tell your name. And Hi, I'm Zuzu. And I'm Katie. So this is, we're for the Blackstone. This is how I feel about the renovation. First off, the Blackstone hasn't had a renovation since 1996. Also, the existing structure is beautiful, but in need of a renovation. The inside needs more room for kids and teens to read and hang out. If we add the terrace, students will be able to study in fresh air and making them more focused. It will also add a space for people of all ages to hang out. It brings the community together for learning and growing and so much more. <coughs> it's all amazing, but with these additions, it would make it better. The Blackstone Library is in need of new books and technology. If we got new computers, it would help lots of students without technology. Did you know that around 70% of teachers assign homework involving a computer? Almost 50% of students aren't able to finish homework assignments. And about 42% of students received a lower grade because they didn't have access to technology. The Blackstone also needs newer books. This will bring more interest to the library. More space will offer more. And I should know because my mom's an educator. And my dad's an architect. 
<laughs> thank you for thank you for letting us speak on behalf of the library. Thank you. Very good. Anyone else that would like to address the body of the RTM? Ma'am, come up. Marianna Mori. Okay. All right. Keep showing up. Like to <laughs> uh, good evening, my uh, esteemed former colleagues. Um, I uh, am uh, now honored to uh, have moved from this body to the body of the Board of Trustees of the Blackstone Library. And it is a true pleasure to be part of this um, organization. <clears throat> um, I would like every one of the people in this room who are here to support this to be able to speak. I don't know if they will. I wish that they will. There's a lot of strong feeling about this. Uh, many people are, have, have addressed the things that were on my list to talk about, so I'm not going to say that again. Um, a couple of things. Uh, what is very troubling to me is a kind of mischaracterization of these things. This is not the want of a few people. This is the result of a very long planning and assessment process surveying of people over the years, five to 600 responses from the community. So to kind of minimize the planning process by saying this is just a want that a few people wanted is, it is very disrespectful to the process. So I would like to correct that on the record that this is not just something that the library board dreamed up, okay? That's number one. Number two, there's also a mischaracterization of what what this entrance is. Um, this lovely woman just said, yes, it will make it easier for people to get into the library in the, in the rain and in the bad weather. That's one thing. But when you add space in one place, a small amount of space, it opens up other space in the library to do the things that will accommodate the needs and goals of the project. There are goals of the project. There are, the goals are to provide better services to the people who live in this town. It is not just some pie in the sky idea, okay? People look at a library and everybody sees a library from their own point of view, okay? I take my grandkids there. I, I, I used to go there when I was a kid. My kids do homework there. Everybody has a piece of the puzzle, okay, a piece of the view. But in fact, what libraries are becoming, which was said uh, very well by uh, Representative Brockett and some other folks, um, as our society changes, people are not going directly in any kind of a straight line to improve their education or their job skills. They, they, some people who have the means will go to college, but other people will stop and start and stop and start and use the library as a focus for finding the right direction for a next effective step. You need to have a welcoming and uh, technologically adept center to do that. As an adult educator most of my life, um, I think that libraries are, uh, it, it, this has been going on, this is a trend in the last 20 years. This is going to increase as the years go on that people are going to be using this free 20, uh, seven days a week option in their community to supplement what is very hard to afford right now for most people. Bradford is a diverse community. We have a lot of people who are new to the community, new to the country, and the, the library should be a welcoming place um, that feels and has the resources that people need. The fact that renovations weren't done 20 years ago to what we would do now, well that, you know, what happens is when you run an organization or you run a building, there's something that goes on. It's called learning, okay? We have to, we have a library in service to learning. So if you learn that you've done something that is not effective, you take the opportunity to correct it. That is not a mistake. That is what you should do as a community. Um, this is an opportunity, a point in time, where there's a million dollar grant available, which may never be available again. If we waffle on this, we may never have the opportunity to do uh, this level of a project. That again is not some frivolous want. It's the re end result of a long and valid 
planning process. Um, I'm assuming you've all read about that on both sides. Um, I think do not minimize what is in this project. It, it is meaningful. It is not trivial. And I ask you all to support what people in this room have come to support and ask you for. And um, one last point. I, roughly a year ago, we voted on an $88 million bonding project, almost exactly a year ago, as a matter of fact, in this room. And we, on my side of the aisle, asked for a 30-day period to reevaluate. At the time, we were all sort of pie in the sky, thinking maybe we would know more about what the state was going to come through with, if we all remember that. Of course, we had no way of knowing it was going to take eight more months, but it was a 30-day request. And the blithe moving through of that bonding project, would have, it, would, it was like it was an $88,000 line item trade. <coughs> so it's kind of breathless worries about a $3 million bonding project. We should worry about spending. We should make sure there are no cost overruns. But we should also take advantage of a point in time where there's a, roughly $2 million uh, being provided to this project that is not coming from the town that we may never be able to have again. The five-year planning process, $800,000 roughly that would have to be returned to the citizens. Over 600 of them felt strongly enough to give small, medium, and some very large gifts. I would urge you to consider all of that when you make your vote. Thank you. Anyone else would like to uh, address the RTM body? Please identify us with your name and address. Hi, my name is, my name is Kim Zalvik, and I live at 21 Forest Street in Granite Bay. Um, I came here tonight to learn more about this. I was undecided. And the gentleman's question of, is this a need versus a want, clarified it for me. And I realized that it is definitely a need for this town. Uh, I am a Sliney mom. I would love to see Sliney improved. But after tonight and hearing all of this and really thinking about it and what the, um, the benefits will be to, you know, citizens of Brantford of all ages, this is definitely a need. Thank you. Anyone else to address the RTM? I see him. I see him. My name is Lloyd Buzzle. I uh, live at 70 Turtle Bay Drive. It's a nice luxury condo, and the world works that you have to put something out to get something. That's the way the world works. So my property taxes are going to go up, and I'm very happy to have my property taxes go up for this reason. I, I am very involved with Canoe Brook Senior Center, and there I meet a lot of people who are just making it on Social Security alone. I, I can have my gas fireplace, my New York Times every day, my over $100 a month to Comcast for all my electronic stuff. And people are on the streets, walking on the side of our streets, because they don't have any means of transportation. They don't have any access to the internet. They need access to the books. They need access to a future. They need access to resume building. And the Blackstone is that for a lot of poor people. And let's face it, look around. How many poor people do we have in this room? This is, this is probably not a very representative group. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of people in this town who need this operation, who need this improvement, who need this $3 million, who need a $1 million from the state, who need $800,000 from the Blackstone, and I really urge you to support this. Anyone else? If not. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Barbara Leet. I live on Harbor Street. I've uh, moved here about 45, 46 years ago. I'd like to speak on behalf of the children. I use the library a lot. I had three children, and uh, they're in their 40s now. I'm old, but um, I now take my grandchildren there. And someone said that the library had been renovated 20 years ago? Well, I was here when the stuffed birds were up there and the uh, arrowheads <laughs> and all of that. I have to say, 
if there was a renovation there, it was very minimal. I really don't see much difference in the library today. And I, to the lady who brought her Dead. grandchild there, mm -hmm. um, I bring the my grandchildren there. And you said you only saw one. But maybe there's a reason, because we need a better um, solution to the children's programs. Um, I go to the Guilford Library a lot, the North Brantford <coughs> Library a lot. They have great children's programs because they have the facility, <coughs> they put the money into it. And I think Brantford definitely needs that for their children today. Um, so, there you go. Hi, my name is Susan Dayhill, and I live at 31 Spring Rock Road. Show you something. This is the book I'm reading. It's called Homegoing. It comes from the Branford Library. It's a life changing book. It's a devastating story that captures the degradations of slavery among both the enslaved and the enslavers. The library also has books like this that tell you more about the history and the people of Ghana where the story starts. It has children's books with photos of Ghana and its people. It has computers where you can research the reviews of the book and read other people's response to it. Most importantly, it has librarians who can help you find all of these things. But the problem is, if you can't get into the library or get around in it, then you can't access all these wonderful resources. Mr. Riccio, Mr. Black, I would like to tell you a story. A few weeks ago, I was walking into the back entrance and an elderly woman who was using a walker was struggling to get in. I stopped to help and she was very generous in her thanks. I realized that it is possible to get into the library with a walker, but it isn't easy. It's possible to use the elevator, but it's not reliable. This is an opportunity to fix problems like these and make sure all our citizens, including people with walkers, people with strollers, will have the chance to enjoy a wonderful resource in which our entire community can take pride. Thank you. Okay, if there's no further uh, comments, uh, represent, uh, Mr. Mazikane. I'm not gonna speak against the project. I'm gonna say, uh, first of all, I think um, my track record speaks for itself. I've spent countless hours posting Blackstone Library events. I have uh, put my money where my mouth is. I've donated to the Blackstone Library. I've been at countless uh, Blackstone Library fundraisers. So uh, there should be no question, but not really about anybody in this room, because I see you all support the Blackstone. I don't really care about the Blackstone. Uh, my issue has always been the process. And uh, the issue, uh, and I'm going to actually tell you a little story. When I first joined the Democratic Town Committee, in fact, Chris was the second person in politics that I talked to on the phone, and I called him up. Eleanor Sterling said to call him up, and he told me about the DGC and how to join. <coughs> Shortly after that, and I think the only person who may remember this might be Dorothy, I think Chris was there. Uh, there was a public hearing for a project Unc wanted to do. And that project was about uh, the center of town. He didn't want those bump outs anymore. He wanted to get rid of those. He wanted to change some of the lights or a bunch of other things he wanted to do in the center of town. So oddly enough, he wanted to have a public hearing. The right thing to do, have a public hearing, find out what the public wants. He had that public hearing, my first ever public hearing, at the Blackstone Library. <clears throat> Let me tell you, the room was packed. Were you there? I, I think you might have been there. It got booed out of the room so fast. I mean, it was, I didn't even know what was going on. I'll be honest, I felt bad for him. And I was working on his campaign, <coughs> making calls for him. I was like, Jesus Christ. He took those plans, there. folded them up, and they're probably sitting on a shelf somewhere, Jamie, in, in town hall. Because that's why you have public hearings, to get where the public is. You hear the pros and cons publicly. You get to hear what people are thinking publicly. We just had a great Genevieve got off. Thank you so much, Genevieve Goff, for talking about the two public hearings that happened for the senior center. 
We talked about how quickly Walsh happened. Why Walsh happened so quickly? There were countless public hearings for Walsh. So I'm not here telling you to vote yes or no tonight. Vote however you want. At the end of the day, I'm gonna be there when this thing opens. I'm gonna take pictures, I'm gonna write articles, I'm gonna get clicks on my website. And I will donate every year to the Blackstone Library. But make sure in the future, when you're spending money, that early in the process, not later, not individual sales pitches, not promoting people down the road or after the plane is done, early in the process, you start with public hearings. That's what was missing here. And if you had started that way, we don't know if the public would have supported it or not, but we didn't get that opportunity. And I've written this a thousand times and I stand by that. I hope this project is successful. If it passes tonight, I hope this becomes the best project in Brantford. And we all love being there and the catered food is great when they have a grand opening and all that stuff. But we need to start projects with public hearings. We need to get people's ideas before we put pen to paper, before we start studying what we want this to look like. Do you know there were many different design options for this building the public never saw? The trustees decided that. That's fine, that's how it works. But it's up to the elected officials who represent not the 50 people behind me, 28,000 people in town, to start these conversations with public hearings. And I hope from now on that is the case on every project. Good luck. Okay. There's no further. One more. Uh, Hi, um, I'm Sandy Baldwin. Um, I am the retired teacher that Adam was talking about, and I am a um, trustee for the Blackstone. And I would like to take issue. Um, we did have, maybe there weren't hearings. But starting five years ago, I believe it was, um, we had many open meetings at the library, inviting everybody in town. We sent out invitations to the entire town, asking anybody who wanted to come to come and look at what we were asking for, what we thought the people in the town wanted. And we made changes. What, you're, what is in front of you today is not what it started out as. We listened to what people had to say, and we did make changes. <coughs> so I wanted to set it straight that um, we did ask for help, and we continue to ask for people's opinions. Um, and I just wanted you all to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Third select Ryan Ahern. Hello, everybody. Jack Ahern, selecting with the town. Um, Karen, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, was it a year or so ago, maybe more, um, your body came and asked for money um, to seed the project? Yes, for okay. money for the... Um, uh, for the design. Yes. And how much was that? $50,000 two years ago. $50,000 two years ago. Thank you. I think that's very important. <clears throat> two years ago, this body, not everybody here, but this, this body, put a step forward and said, we want to go down the road of doing this project. I think that if you are not going to eventually approve the project, don't ever let that happen. Don't give somebody $50,000, and then two years later when they come back and they say, this is what it's going to cost, say, nope, I'm not going to do it, because you just blew $50,000. So going back to the needs and the wants of the town, yeah, maybe it's not a need as some things are. The school is a need, for sure. Um, public works is a need. I don't see anything happening with that, unfortunately. Nothing happening with that. But that's a need. The fortunate thing about Brantford is that we can afford wants. Maybe some people don't agree with it. And I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are people Representative Riccio, that are against it. But you picked up a piece of paper and the wrong one first because that was probably for it. Um, a lot of people are for it. They're in the audience tonight. I'm not sure I heard anybody speak against it here tonight. I think, in general, people in this town, yeah, they may not be happy that taxes may go up a little bit, 
but $5.4 million is not going to be the tax increase that $88 million was. <laughs> and this is something that 10,000 people in the town have library cards, is that right? 10,000 people in this town have a library card. That doesn't mean they have to go to the library either. That doesn't mean that when you go into the library, if there's only three people in there, that it's not being used. You can use your card electronically to take out books electronically. So there's a lot of different things that, this, that the library has to offer. Um, I'm very happy. I haven't seen this room filled with the public since we tried to get this building. <laughs> and it was successful because we had people supporting it. And I think that's very important. There are, there are very few people here tonight, if any, from the public that are against this project. And I think that's something to think about. But just remember, this body, the Board of Finance, all put their step forward about a year ago or so, two years ago, to get $50,000. You should have said no then if you didn't want the project to go forward. Thank you. Representative Black. Yeah, I'd like to respond specifically to that, um, the $50,000 comment. I do remember when that went forward, I did vote against it at that time. And the argument at that time, Representative Imperato, then Representative Prado made the motion. And it was quite clear this was not a final approval. This was seed money. We would have a second bite at the apple. Um, and that was the way that was presented to this body so that nobody on this body or on the Blackstone Library should have interpreted that as any final approval or um, for this project. Um, so I have and you know, as far as the you know, I was mentioned on a couple things on the community center, et cetera, that it's not built yet. So, you know, if you're not getting rooms, it's because we haven't built it yet. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's coming down. Um, pardon? Well, maybe we shouldn't have, but, you know, we're going down that road. And as far as the, uh, you know, $88 million, I mean, we're committed to that, which makes it, all the more important that we are careful about taking on new debt. And uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens here tonight. Thank you. All right. One more person there. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tamara Mokas, and I live at 24 Arrowhead Lane in Brantford. Um, I am also a, a townie. I've been here. Um, pretty much as long as uh, I can remember. Um, I was also in the library when there were birds and arrowheads in there with my Girl Scout troop and my Brownie troop. And when you used to get a book, and every time you got a book, you moved your little um, thumbtack across the United States to show how far you've traveled by reading a book. So um, I am not a library hater. I am not a Blackstone library person who um, is opposed to the programming that is in the library and what the library does for our community. What I am opposed to is the cost of this. I am opposed to this at the cost of this at a time in our state where fiscal uh, responsibility is falling more and more on the communities. It's falling more in our communities to spend money on our town's infrastructures. Um, our educational cost sharing amount of money uh, that's going to our communities because of the state uh, fiscal crisis is going to be less and less, which is going to be more and more of a burden on us as taxpayers. Unfortunately, I feel that the time of this project, um, when, we, when there's so much turmoil and upheaval <coughs> and disarray at the state level, um, the time of this project along with that is not the right time. Um, I, I feel badly um, for what all the people who have done the planning on this, who have worked so hard and so diligently uh, for this, but I just have to say that I wish this was another time. I wish it was a better time. I wish it was a better fiscal and financial time for us as a community. I just feel right now it is not 
the right time. And I, that's all I have to say. And thank you very much. No, I'm not. She, she's already spoke. I'm not going. <laughs> Some uh, Representative Torelli. Marianne, you already spoke once already. I have a question. No. Yeah. I have a question. Please. Clear just the floor. Uh, Finance Director Finch is in the room. What are you doing? That's that's inappropriate. Uh, Representative Torelli, you had your hand up. Yes. I'm sorry. As I came into this room, I was against it. I had several phone calls, people asking me to support this. I had one that asked me not to. Uh, I've gotten a multitude of emails for and against it. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of this town, and my kids went to the library when it was downstairs. Why they moved it upstairs, I'll never know, because it's, that's not the ideal place. But that's, that's not the issue. The issue is, can we afford it? Do we want more taxes? It's according to the Board of Finance, they passed it. According to Jim Finch, we can afford it. We do have money, surplus of money, so we're not putting ourselves into debt over it. It doesn't, it sounds like a lot of money, but when you compare it to the two projects we've got going, it's a drop in the bucket. Um, I think a lot of people have worked hard on this. And I think the entrance is a disaster for the handicapped people to get into. I can't even imagine having a wheelchair try to get in there. Um, we've got to get those kids out of that floor that it's a potential hazard. I don't care what anybody says. So I have changed my mind. Um, crossed overruns, I was very concerned with because I built my own house and I know how the crossed overruns are easy to, it's easy to happen. Uh, supposedly you're going to have that in hand. Uh, the existing uh, air conditioning and heating, that I was interested in that and, and you said that that's going to be able to take on this addition and so it, that's not going to be a, a major expense. The entrance, is it overkill? It might be. Um, I, if it can bring in the money that the people are saying it's with weddings and whatever, um, you know, it might pay for itself. Um, <coughs> sure, does it have everything everybody needs plus some? Absolutely. And there's probably some that can be cut. Can we take this back and, and go over it again and bring it back to the table? That's a possibility. But I, at this point, will uh, vote for it. Any further comments for the RTM? Are anybody from the RTM? I should uh, uh, make note here that I do have a letter from the Board of Finance Chairman Joe Mooney. Uh, attention, Dennis Flanagan, moderator, at the meeting of the Board of Finance held on December 18, 2017. The following resolution was adopted. Resolve that the resolution entitled Resolution Appropriating $5,245,000 for the Blackstone Memorial Library Renovation 2018 and authorizing the issue of 5,245,000 bonds of the town to meet said appropriation and pending the issuance thereof, the making up temporary borrowings for such purpose is hereby adopted and recommended for approval by the RTM. Moderator, yes. I'll make a motion that we waive reading the full resolution. Yeah, I was going to do that next. The motion on the floor to uh, waive the, the full reading of the resolution. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. If there's no further comments from the RTM or anybody else. We will now, this will be a roll call vote. Roll call vote. Representative Edelman. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Representative Alphone. Yes. Representative Anderson. Yes. Representative Black. 
No. Representative Brockett? Yes. Representative Buchanan? Yes. Representative Comey? Yes. Representative Conklin? No. Representative Dokovich? Yes. Representative Dunbar? Yes. Representative Hansen, yes. Representative Henschel? Yes. Representative Ingraham? No. Representative Jackson? Yes. Representative Kelly? No. Representative Lawler? No. Representative Leonard? No. Representative Riccio? No. <laughs> Representative Sandler? I'm going to pass. Pass. Representative Stepanek? No. Representative Sullivan? Yes. Representative Torelli? Yes. Representative Tuhill? Yes. Representative Walker? No. Representative Wells? Yes. Representative Zambrano? No. And Representative Diadamo? No. Give me a sec, Mr. Moderator. Go back to Robin. Back to Robin. Oh, sorry. Robin. Yeah, Robin. I don't know yet. Hold on. All right, give me a sec just to make sure I got it right. Fifteen to eleven. Fifteen yes, eleven no on my first count. That's what I have. Agreed. Good. Fifteen yes, eleven no. Motion yes. carries. Thank you so much. Thank you. A little adventure in town without democracy. <laughs> you would leave. Okay, I understand. Yep. Okay. We'll make we'll, we'll make notation. Thank you, Representative Adelman. Okay, back to the call itself. Uh, we'll back to item three on the call. Why don't we take a five minute break? All right, we'll take a uh, 10 minute break. Moderator. Rules and ordinances met on uh, December 19th to review item number uh, three on our agenda. Uh, this is a motion to uh, amend changes to Rule A236-4 on our, in our uh, RTM rules. Uh, after discussion, uh, and I'll read the language. The majority leader and minority leader shall be ex officio members without voting power of all standing committees. And then the pertinent changes, the majority and minority leaders may, however, be voting members of the standing committee or committees to which appointed pursuant to subsection A2. The effect of this is that the majority leader, in addition to the minority leader, will serve or may serve to the committee to On which the subcommittees. Okay. Subcommittee. The standing committees. Right. Standing committees. Standing committee, mm -hmm. correct. Uh, that motion was seconded and passed unanimously in committee. And uh, further, it's been reviewed by the town attorney 
and he has no objection to the language as it was approved by the RNL committee. So your motion is to approve? And that's in the form of a motion. Any discussion on the motion? Representative Hansen? I might be only one of 30, but I am strongly opposed to this. Um, I know the rules fairly well, and uh, from reading them when I first got on, I, this was one that I always thought was one of our better rules. And looking at our, um, our federal system, look at our state system, I've always looked at our majority and minority leaders as kind of being a general overseer of the health and welfare of the body, uh, being ex officios of all five standing committees. Um, it's a huge responsibility, you know. Uh, these guys go into all five meetings, uh, being abreast of everything that's going on. Um, another responsibility is staying in constant contact with the um, committee chairs to know what is being proposed, how the votes are going, yada, yada. So um, I just, I, I'm afraid, and this has nothing to do with, against you, Ray, personally, whether it's, whether it's you or whether Frank was the majority leader, or whether Chris was the majority leader, it's the position, and I think that it's just going to take away, um, not take away, but add to the responsibilities, and uh, especially a, a committee like r and I sat on r and uh, with Robin, Jim Walker, and um, it was an in-depth, very in-depth committee looking at rewriting, looking at uh, introducing, and I'm just afraid that if you delve too far into the committees, without state taking a step back and being just the effect ex officio, that it might take away from your global perspective. Again, I'm probably one of 30 that feels like this. However, uh, in Quakis, I compromised with my folks, and uh, I was w uh, willing to um, propose an amendment. Um, let me see how I want to put it. To say, the majority leader and minority leader shall be ex officio members without voting power of all standing committees the majority and minority leaders may, however, be voting members of the standing committee or committees to which appointed pursuant to section, subsection A-2, but cannot be the chair of the committee, of any committees. Because in that point, I feel that being the chair, that that's a huge responsibility, and now they need to delve deeper into the committee process. Representative Ingraham? Is there a yeah. second on that? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a second on the amendment? I'll second the amendment. Representative Henschel? Okay. Discussion? Ray? Representative Ingram? On the amendment, yes. No. Like I said, nothing, against, nothing against you, Ray. Just, just, on the amendment, right. Uh, I'm not so sure I'm far against that. That actually gives the majority leader and minority leader a hell of a lot more power. <laughs> with being able to show up to meetings and vote as a member on every committee. So you would have responsibilities of being there. That's, from what I hear you read, that they would be ex officio with voting rights. No. Is what no, you would you would be ex officio. You would be a voting member of the committee. So you would be voting members of every committee. No. No, no, no. A of whatever committee you were on. That's what I proposed. That's, that's, what, that's what I think he was. Like the rule that was proposed was that the minority leader and majority leader may, mm -hmm. which took out in case someone didn't want to do it or you know yeah. life you know life work and then this, mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're separate all three, uh, that they would be able to choose you know by by their position whether they they wanted to serve, mm -hmm. and that they would be able to you know vote on the one or two I doubt they would take two, but committees that they were assigned to. I'm not sure what your, your amendment sounded to well, me like. My amendment is that you can still, the majority and minority leaders may, however, be voting members of the, of the standing committee or committees to which appointed pursuant to subsection A2, That's however, not be able to be the chair oh, of the committee. Oh, That's oh, my amendment. Oh, oh. So he's saying. Vote the, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am sorry, and I totally agree. There's, there, there shouldn't be a chairman. And do we need that to be reviewed by town council, or are we good? No. On this? no. Yeah, that sure. amendment was. Uh, I don't know. Fine, right? Any further discussion on the yeah. amendment? Hearing none. All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 Opposed. The amendment passes. <coughs> we have to vote on the amended main so motion. So now we have to vote as the main motion as amended, and the other, the only change being that the the majority changed. leader cannot uh, serve a chair on the of the on the subcommittee. 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. <coughs> item carries as amended. Okay, got that? Yep. Item four, to consider if appropriate, create an ordinance that enables tax exemptions for Gold Star parents and spouses. Representative Leonard. Need the microphone down here. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, rules and ordinances met on this uh, this item also on the same evening, 1219. Uh, while generally supportive of the proposed ordinance, uh, there was a motion to re-refer, which passed unanimously in order to uh, allow further study of what's going to be a somewhat complex ordinance. And I'll put that in the form of a motion. Motion on the floor to re-refer this item. I'll second it. Second. Yeah, don't need it. Doesn't need a second. It's aye. 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 all those in favor of the re-referring the item signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. The item is re-referred. And five to consider if it appropriate appropriate approve request from the Board of Police Commissioners for the following fiscal 2018 budget transfer from contingency 38,400 to regular wages and salaries 38,400. Representative Black. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Ways and Means met jointly with Public Services on this item a week ago, and we all voted unanimously in favor of this. And at this point, I'll, uh, with your leave, I'll give the microphone and the floor over to uh, the Chair of Public Services, who has a uh, brief explanation of the need for this transfer. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moderator. The Public Service Committee heard this, as Peter said, in a special joint meeting with Ways and Means on January 3rd. Public Service heard this transfer because it increases the 2017-2018 police budget previously approved by this committee by the said 38,400. As stated, the purpose of the transfer is solely to fund the new deputy chief position. Historically, uh, more recently, we experimented with the force without this position. At this time, the chief, the board of police commissioners, our first selectman, uh, and the board of finance uh, are in support of the 38,400 for this new or renewed position. Last month, the Board of Finance approved this transfer. The Public Service Committee, with all seven in attendance, voted unanimously to make this transfer, and we moved that this $38,400 be transferred from contingency to police regular wages and salaries. Thank you. Any uh, <clears throat> discussion on the motion? Yes, Representative yes. Brockett? Thank you. You need the um, mic. You need the mic. Together? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think everybody can hear me. I probably don't need the it's mic. For, it's, for the it's, for the it's for the TV. It's for the TV. It's for TV. So. <laughs> we should get I'll some just more. talk in a softer tone then. I had some concerns on the motion that was presented to both committees, and I sit on both committees. I did vote for it, and I'll vote for it tonight, but I want the record to reflect the concerns that I have um, with respect to this position. This is a new position that's being created. It is being created for, according to the police commissioner and the police chief, for the purposes of succession because there are a couple of captains in the police department that could be leaving fairly soon and perhaps the chief is going to retire <coughs> shortly as well. I think there are other reasons that this town needs a deputy chief in the police force. And one of the most important reasons is, is this is a department where the chief manages 85 people over three bargaining units. There's a police union, there's a clerical union, and there the dispatcher's union. Right now, the chief is the CEO of these 85 people, and everybody else is in some kind of a bargaining unit, and I think it's very difficult to run a town agency with just one person. So. I'm voting for it for that reason. Another concern I had was, if this body recalls, a few years back, the police lost their defined benefit plan um, in the course of negotiations. 
as a result of the loss of that defined benefit plan, our police department, 50% of our police department now only has five years or less experience. What is happening is they're coming here, we're paying for them, we're paying for their training, and then they're shipping off to another town that has better benefits. How does that affect this issue? It affects it this way. There seemed to be some kind of an indication that when maybe the captains retire, those positions wouldn't be filled. I would be opposed to that for the reason, same reasons as they should have a pension plan. We will lose more police. They will have no promotional advancement. Right now you have sergeants, you have lieutenants, you have two captains, and now we're gonna have a deputy and we're gonna, we have a chief. So if my position would be that the captain should remain. I understand that's a bargainable issue and I'm voting in favor of this amendment, but I just wanted the record to reflect that I think that the captain should remain in the, in, inside the police department in the bargaining unit. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Okay, Representative Brock, and I think at the meeting it was discussed also that uh, this, this transfer is strictly for the deputy chief, and we understand your concerns, but this is not relevant to the transfer itself. So I think you were aware of that. Okay. Any, Representative Henschel? Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, I just, I had uh, wanted to make the point that every time we have a, a request to transfer money out of contingency, I think it would be a good idea if the RTM was provided with a status report on the contingency, and I had asked um, our finance director for that information and wanted to read it out. Hopefully in the future this will be provided in, in the due course um, when we do have these requests. But the, uh, the beginning balance of the, the contingency was $1,112,000. $1,923. We've had uh, transfers out on 925 to the Blackstone Library, the fire agreement, and the DPW agreement. And with tonight's transfer, um, it will bring the contingency down to $789,065 for point of information. Thank you. Representative Henschel, you can also request that from the chairman of the uh, Ways and Means Committee. He, can, he, he has a running figure of what's, what's the balance on contingency. And so normally, I will, it's, will say Representative Black, he didn't do it tonight, but he normally gets up and tells us what's left in the contingency all the time. So, but the, I mean, if, if we could provide that with yeah, the agenda right. item as part of the okay. information, it would be helpful. Any further discussion on the item? Representative Black? I want the body to be clear that, you know, this is talking to the police chief and the commissioner, it's probably about three months out of hiring a deputy chief that this position, we're, as you know, we're halfway or more into the current fiscal year. So this is really the 38,000 is covering about a quarter of a year's salary. The benefits portion is not in the departmental budget, as we all know. So this is an additional probably $150,000 of expense that the town is taking on on an annual basis. As Representative Brockett said, you know, whether we make up for that somewhere else or eliminate this position, that's a decision to be taken later, you know, probably two years from now um, after we see what's happening with the transition. But, this position is needed to bulk up our leadership in the police department at a time when we're facing a number of uh, departures at critical positions. So I just wanted everybody to be aware of the timeline and the whole cost. This isn't a, a one-shot $38,000 uh, expense that there'll be an additional line item in the budgets that'll be coming to us. I don't know, Jamie, I'm, Jim, I'm guessing 150 is pretty uh, close to an all-in cost of salary and benefits, and that, that's a that's a guesstimate. So uh, again, we do feel this as a committee. We heard this. We feel this position is needed, and uh, it's one of those things that we just bite the bullet and uh, write the check. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none. All those in, uh, Representative Dunbar? I'll be abstaining. Abstaining? 
Uh, okay. Yeah. Hearing no uh, further discussion, uh, all those in favor of the of the transfer signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Abstention. We have one. Motion carries. Next meeting. Okay, Representative Torelli, a motion to adjourn. We have a second. Minutes to the yeah. summer meeting, they were never approved. It's a special meeting. We just, you don't. Just, so there are eight next meeting. Next meeting. <laughs> Torelli, who's, sec who's the new seconder? Marianne's gone. I'll second. Okay. All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we are adjourned for the first special. The, first the preceding program was brought to you through the support of. The Town of Brantford. Watch town meetings or other videos on demand at BrantfordTV.org. You're watching BCTV, Brantford's Community Access Station. This is BCTV, Brantford Government Television, a service of Brantford Community Television. The following program is brought to you through the support of the town of Brantford. This thing on? Yeah. No, hold on no, okay. <laughs> okay, I'd like to call the uh, RTM back to order for special meeting uh, number two, and uh, we'll have a roll call vote. Roll call. Representative Edelman. Huh? Alphone. Here. Anderson. Here. Black. Yes. Brockett. Here. Buchanan. Comey. Here. Conklin. Here. Dokovich. Here. Dunbar. Present. Flanagan here. Uh, Hall. Hansen here. Henschel. Here. Ingraham. Here. Jackson. Here. Kelly. Here. Waller. Here. Leonard. Here. Preet. Riccio. Here. Sandler. Here. Stepanek. Here. Sullivan. Still here. Torelli. Present. Two Hill. Here. Walker. Wells? Here. Zambrano? Here. And Diadama? Here. Quorum? Okay. <clears throat> Fastest roll call ever. <laughs> we won't need to uh, do item two under uh, reception of communications and committee reports. We already had that from the first one. We'll move right into the call itself. Item three, to consider and, if appropriate, approve the following land transactions for the town of Brantford. A. Granting of an easement to Eversource over the town-owned land at 100 Tabor Drive and 48-86 Tabor Drive to replace existing poles and utility lines and install additional poles and utility lines for electric service to the solar array project on 48-86 Tabor Drive, and B, acceptance of a sanitary sewer easement from 5 Pin Oak Drive, LLC, 5 Pin Oak Drive for existing sewer mains, force main pump station. Representative Alphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, admin services heard both of these items at our January 2nd meeting. Uh, the first, just to cover it quickly, um, the easement covers an area of roadways starting at the intersection of Tabor Drive and Marshall Road. It runs along Marshall Road into the parking area for Ecology Park. Um, the easement is for Eversource. Uh, they need it in place before they can replace the utility poles going down Marshall Road and going to the new solar array. Um, this did pass through committee with unanimous vote. And do you want to just roll right into the second one? Yeah. Yes. Right again. Again. <laughs> <laughs> the second is for an easement um, of a parcel of land where Pin Oak and Sycamore Drive meet. Uh, there's two pump stations on the east side of the property. They've been there since the 80s. There was just never an easement <clears throat> actually uh, on file. 
So this is just to clean up some paperwork. Bulk items did pass for uh, ready, and I put that forward to full body. Yes. <clears throat> you put in the form of a motion? In the form of a motion. Any discussion on the motion? We have one person raising their hand. Steve? Twice. Steve, this is not near your house, so don't worry about it. Oh, it's two different meetings, so this isn't twice. <laughs> different items. <laughs> All right, so well, actually kind of near my house. I want to say this. Um, today I got in a conversation at a coffee shop, which I'm at on a regular basis, on Trump's plan to allow drilling off the shore in more places. And I'm not a fan of that, and this person wasn't a fan of that. And uh, I got to thinking and talking to them about some of the things this town has done that are unbelievably forward thinking when it comes to alternative energy, solar power, parks, things of that nature. Uh, when the plan of conservation and development meeting took place, somebody stood up and said, we need to have more solar, we need to do more alternative energy stuff. And I think the one thing that should be clear on this is everyone here, left or right, it doesn't matter that the first elephant happens to be a Republican. If you're a liberal or if you care about the environment, you should be proud to live in this town and you should be preaching from the rooftops the things you guys and our first selectmen and our board of finance are doing. This is an unbelievable project that other towns are looking at saying, how is this going to go? Because I go to Guilford meetings and they're talking about this project. What will it mean to town and the energy people? So you guys have, and the town has, under complete bipartisanship, passed this, more new parks than we've had in years from Brantford Hills. We have a $6 million investment in it, which is far more than light bulbs, but a $6 million energy plan that pays for itself. Uh, with the top of the, the, the hill there we have, we have an unbelievable amount of things that are happening that are environmentally friendly. And I know you want to compare local parties to national, Chris, but let me tell you something. This, the way this town treats the environment and open space and alternative energy, is nowhere near what's happening in the national in the country right now. On top of this building so right here too. We should all be praising that to our constituents and, and making sure people realize that party plays no role. This is a town that puts its environment first. Thanks. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion to approve these land transactions? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? <laughs> Item carries. Okay. Item four, German. Representative Torelli. Aye. Torelli Second. And Second. All those, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. The preceding program was brought to you through the support of the Town of Brantford. Watch town meetings or other videos on demand at BrantfordTV.org.